Hey everyone, um, so for the last couple of weeks um, I've been posting uh, these videos um, that basically go through all of the lectures that we otherwise would have gone through um, in person um, through the last third um, of the theory of computation class. So one of the things that I'm noticing um, is that if I were a student, um, I would not necessarily have time um, or the attention span to maybe sit down for an hour and look at a video um, with a whole bunch of different concepts in it. So what I'm going to try to do this week um, is post uh, several more, much shorter videos um, and kind of limit those videos to one idea a video, um, which should hopefully help you um, kind of maybe retain the information or make the, the information more accessible. So uh, in this first one we're going to talk about is uh, non-deterministic Turing machines. Uh, Non-determinism is certainly a concept that we have looked at in the past. Um, but we're going to look at it uh, from the perspective of Turing machines at uh, this time. So um, in the last video, what we did um, is we looked at a whole bunch of common modifications to the standard definition of a Turing machine. And uh, we really focused on showing that those modifications, even though they make the machine seem in some ways fancier or seem like they should uh, improve the machine's ability to actually perform problem solving or computing, um, that isn't necessarily the case. Um, and in all of the cases that we talked about last time, even though we were able to come up with a more fancy uh, storage solutions or if we were come, able to come up with different features that we could add to the read-write head, um, we were not able to actually extend um, what the machine was able to compute. Um, one of the ways that we used to show um, that two different machines uh, were equivalent, even though they didn't necessarily have the same set of features, um, was this idea of simulation. Um, and so what we're going to do this time um, is we're going to introduce the idea of a non-deterministic Turing machine um, and we're going to use that uh, non-deterministic uh, Turing machine concept um, then in the next video uh, to derive what a, a universal Turing machine kind of looks like um, and what the purpose of such a machine actually is. So um, a non-deterministic uh, Turing machine actually looks exactly like um, what a deterministic Turing machine looks like. Um, so if you were to pull up um, this slide and the slide for the deterministic Turing machine uh, mathematical definition, um, they turn out to be the exact same slide. Um, but there are three things uh, to note. Um, and the first of these um, is that effectively all of the components themselves uh, remain identical. Um, so you uh, don't necessarily have any additional pieces uh, to this tuple. You don't necessarily have um, things meaning drastically different things. Um, but uh, there is some different. There are some differences under the under the hood. So um, as we talked about previously with different types of machines. Um, what non-determinism does essentially is say that you can have one configuration, so one set of uh, current state in the control unit, um, one current um, alphabet symbol that you're reading off of the input tape, um, and based on that current uh, state, you can go to multiple new states. Um, so if we go back to the idea of turnstile notation from two videos ago, um, we can actually take one intermediate representation of a Turing machine and we can go um, to multiple different instantaneous uh, definitions or instantaneous configurations of that same Turing machine um, given the same input. So um, if we go all the way back to the second uh, lecture in the class, <clears throat> we know that this is not necessarily a function then. Um, the transition function itself, delta, is actually a relation. Um, we, we, it, this thing would not necessarily pass um, the vertical line test. Um, so it isn't a function. Um, it is a mapping uh, between inputs and outputs. Um, and just so happens that some of those outputs can be sets, um, not necessarily a single, um, a single state. So um, technically speaking, um, we have a transition relation instead of a transition function. Um, so for a deterministic Turing machine, which we've been talking about up to this point, um, we have this uh, delta, this definition of delta, um, that takes a state <clears throat> and a, an alphabet symbol and then gives you a potentially new state and a potentially new alphabet symbol and a movement of the read-write head either left um, or to the right. 
uh, for a non-deterministic machine, we have the exact same uh, concept and we have the concept of sequential configurations. Um, however, uh, we have a much more uh, interesting situation um, where the output of any uh, of any step um, or any rule in the uh, transition relation is actually some subset um, of this of the Cartesian product of these things. Um, and so what this uh, is right here is this is the um, set of all possible configurations that are in the range of this function. Uh, what we're saying here is this is just a transition rule that's inside of our transition or our transition relation. Um, and the output is going to be some subset of all possible uh, configurations. Uh, so we could have one, we could have two, we could have 97, we could potentially have all of the possible um, combinations of um, an internal state, a, an alphabet symbol, um, and uh, a left or a right movement. Um, typically, you won't have all of them, but you could. So um, it's very fundamental to understand um, that what we're trying to communicate here is that given some state and given some input symbol that you're reading off of the tape, uh, we can actually now arrive at multiple different outcomes. Um, so we are no longer restricted to just having one possible outcome. Um, now we can uh, we can arrive at a whole bunch of different um, outcomes at the same time. So the obvious thing that you might be thinking to yourself is that because we are now able to effectively um, perform multiple transitions at the same time um, and arrive at multiple configurations concurrently. Um, we have obviously um, improved in some ways the computability of the machine or we've allowed the machine to solve problems that it otherwise would not be able to solve. Um, and is that correct? It seems like it should be correct, but it's actually not. Um, so non-deterministic machines are actually capable of solving the exact same set of problems that a deterministic machine is able to compute or solve. Um, there are just some uh, kind of hand wavy answers to related questions that we're going to talk about at the end, uh, at the end of the video. So if we want to show um, that these two things are in fact computationally equivalent, we can do exactly what we were doing in the last video and effectively simulate one on the other and then vice versa and show that computing power is not related um, to this new concept um, of being able to arrive at multiple configurations um, through the transition relation. And so if I start with one of these non-deterministic machines that has this new feature where I can arrive at multiple different um, outcomes uh, given the same input, um, basically all I need to do is restrict the relation to being a function. Um, so what this is saying um, is in the easy direction, basically I just need to not use the fact um, that I uh, have a relation. What I need to do um, is prune out all of the um, all of the transition rules that don't uh, lead me to acceptance or reject, uh, rejecting uh, the string. And if I have multiples, um, then basically what I need to do is insert uh, some states or I need to insert um, some trivial movements um, to make sure that any of the inputs uh, that lead to uh, a different output are unique. Um, the other direction is a little more complicated. Um, so if I start with a deterministic machine, how can it be possible to simulate a non-deterministic machine that is capable of actually multi uh, going to multiple uh, configurations given the same input? Um, well, the idea is I can separate that set of, input out of output configurations into a whole bunch of different uh, solitary rules. And so if I start with something um, that is a rule, and on the right-hand side of that rule, I have a set of potential configurations, and I've just called them C sub i through C sub i plus 1, um, I can actually create um, a whole list of rules um, called uh, delta sub i, um, and that accepts that exact same input, q sub i and a sub i, and leads me to each of the possible outcomes. Uh, so c sub i or c sub i plus 1, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so obviously if I had a delta sub 9 million and 1, um, I would have a c sub 9 million and 1 um, as long as that c was actually in my original set of possible outcomes. So now um, what I need to do is say that my control unit um, that implements uh, my transitions 
Um, all that needs to happen is I write each of these uh, possible configurations onto a multi-track tape. Um, so what we're effectively saying is that instead of having one non-deterministic machine, I have multiple deterministic machines that all share a transition function. And that transition function has a mapping between the index of the machine that I'm trying to simulate and the outcome of that one potential rule. Um, and so obviously you could do this exact same thing for any number of rules and you could do this exact same thing for any number of output configurations for any of those rules. So because we have already shown that a multi-tape uh, machine um, with multi-tracks um, does not violate um, any of the, the rules that we've set up and they actually have exactly the same uh, computable or computation power um, as a standard Turing machine, uh, we know that we can use a multi-track, multi-tape machine in order to simulate um, this non-deterministic machine, and if we are capable of doing so, um, then we know that this non-deterministic machine and its simulator are both uh, functionally equivalent to a standard Turing machine. Um, and this leads us to theorem 10.2 in the book, um, which states that the class of all deterministic Turing machines and the class of all non-deterministic Turing machines are, in giant air quotes, equivalent. Um, so recall that what we are calling equivalent here um, means that they can accept the same strings um, or they can solve the same problems or they can compute um, the same tasks as each other. Um, this does not mean anything about their speed. Um, this doesn't mean anything about their actual structure. All it means is that they can compute the same problems and they can arrive at reasonable solutions to those problems. So some points about non-deterministic machines. <clears throat> um, the simulation that we just went through um, and the simulation in the textbook, which is slightly different, um, does give us some insight into what is actually happening within this type of machine. Um, and so rather than having only one pathway through a configuration uh, or through a specific con configuration that represents an algorithm, um, there is actually multiple possible paths um, through the Turing machine um, that could arrive at multiple different outcomes. Uh, potentially some of those configurations arrive at an accepting state, uh, potentially some of them just terminate in the void, and some of them uh, terminate in a rejected state. Um, so in order to um, sort of reconcile all of that, um, we say that as long as there is one configuration or one path in, in, in any of those trees of configurations that accepts um, a string, the non-deterministic machine accepts the string. It is not true that all of the possible paths have to converge uh, to an accepting state. Uh, potentially, you could have a million different paths through um, the possible configurations, and only one of those million paths um, actually accepts the string. But as long as one of them accepts the string, then um, the string is accepted by the machine. And uh, just from a sort of colloquial kind of wrapping your head around the situation perspective, um, you can actually think about this as massive parallelization. Um, basically what is happening is at any time t, um, you can go to some new configuration t plus 1 um, that has 75 different possible configurations or 95 possible configurations. And if any of those configurations um, includes an accepting state, um, then we are free to accept the string and not move on to any subsequent configuration. And so instead of um, requiring the one and only configuration or path that you're going through for the algorithm to accept, um, now you can effectively look for an accepting path um, with massive parallelization. You're potentially going through many, 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 many different paths through a tree at the same time. So um, to make the concept of acceptance and decidability uh, fairly rigorous, um, what we say is a non-deterministic uh, Turing machine accepts all, if it accepts all the strings in a language, then the Turing machine accepts that language um, if and only if there is a single path that is capable of accepting those strings. Um, so potentially there are going to be a number of configurations that do not accept um, some or all of those strings, and that's entirely fine. As long as there is a, an accepting path 
for uh, each string in the language, uh, we say that the Turing machine um, actually accepts that language. Um, more rigorously, um, if we have a non-deterministic Turing machine, in order for it to be a decider for the language, it has to have a sing single path that results in a rejection or an acceptance of each string in the language. Um, and the, uh, the configurations can't all just sort of throw their hands up and say that they're, they don't know. Um, so if you think about um, the lecture, I think three lectures ago now, uh, where we talked about special accepting and rejecting states for Turing machines, um, what uh, decidability means is that the machine is capable of reaching one of those, either an accepting or a rejecting state um, for every string in the language. So this brings up the excellent question of um, what happens if there is one path that accepts the string and one path that rejects the string. Um, in that case, that is not a, an inconsistent algorithm. Um, it's effectively a Turing machine that is not capable of distinguishing between the, the two cases for a given input. And typically that would be considered some, of, some sort of aberrant case um, that, that isn't necessarily something that we want to get into, um, especially in this course. So if you have a Turing machine that both accepts and rejects a string, um, what that effectively means is that the algorithm that that Turing machine is implementing is not implemented correctly. Um, and uh, it, there are inconsistencies in that implementation that need to be rectified before the, the Turing machine is actually doing what you expect it to do. Um, because obviously you don't want to be in a situation where you can't determine um, if a thing is accepted or rejected. So this um, is a kind of uh, visualization of the difference between a deterministic acceptor and a deterministic decider. Um, what we see here is each of these uh, nodes or each of these vertices in the graph are configurations. Um, and so each of these nodes have some number of symbols that are written on the input tape. Um, they have some internal state inside of the control unit um, and they have a specific position for the read write head. Um, what we see on the left is that there is an accepting state um, and for some uh, strings there is a pathway um, through this, uh, this tree effectively that gets you to um, that accepting state. Um, and so the language that is constructed by all of the strings that have such a path um, would be the language that is accepted by this Turing machine. Um, and so again, all of these vertices are configurations. They are not states inside of the control unit. They have much more information uh, inside of them. So this thing cannot be a non-deterministic decider because there is no rejecting state um, here. So there is no configuration that um, leads us to a rejecting state inside of the control unit. So because that is true, anything that is not accepted by this Turing machine is ultimately going to end up in a configuration that does not have an accept state and it does not have a reject state. So it's effectively in the nether. Um, it's, in, it's in between the two um, and we cannot know if the machine is still processing um, and potentially eventually um, accepts the string or if um, we are actually rejecting the string and we're just going to continue processing for forever. Compare this to the right-hand side picture um, where we have this red uh, state here, and this red state um, represents a configuration of the machine um, that terminates in a rejecting state. And so in this particular configuration down here on the right-hand side, um, what we have is the internal state in that configuration is the rejecting state for the control unit. Um, and so because um, we have a mechanism by which we can say um, some strings have a path through the tree to an accepting state, and at the end of the day, the configuration will be in an internal state that accepts the string. Um, and and this, when this case is not necessarily true, there is a pathway through um, to get to a rejecting state. Um, so this would be a decider for that particular language, assuming that the language did not have strings that went to this uh, state over here um, that is neither an accepting or a rejecting state. Um, so what we would be saying is this, this machine has additional um, aspects to it that allow us to do things for languages that are neither accepted um, or rejected or strings that are neither accepted or rejected, um, but those strings cannot be part of the language 
that the machine is a decider for. Um, so um, strictly speaking, if you cover this thing up and you look at only the strings that are either accepted or um, rejected, that would be a, uh, this would be a decider for only that language. Uh, we would not be able to consider something that can terminate um, inside of a state that is neither rejecting or um, accepting. So this leads us to the big unanswered question, um, sort of the elephant in the room uh, that's been here for quite some time, uh, since maybe the first uh, lecture in the, the third part of the course. Um, and that is that we have shown that non-deterministic and, and deterministic Turing machines are equivalent, which means that they can solve the same problems, um, but it does not necessarily mean that they can do the same with the, with the same time resources. Um, so there is a very well-known outstanding question in theoretical computer science um, that tries to determine the equivalence or uh, in unequivalence of uh, the set of problems denoted by the problems that can be computed in uh, what's called polynomial time um, versus those that cannot be solved in polynomial time. Um, in just a, a two-minute explanation, polynomial time means that um, you can compute the answer to the problem um, given a number or an amount of time resources that is comparable to a polynomial um, based on the size of the string. Um, so if you give me a string of size 7, um, I can uh, find a solution um, that is a polynomial um, of roughly size 7. Um, a problem that cannot be um, solved in uh, that amount of time is referred to as an NP problem or a problem in the set of NP problems. Um, and those uh, typically take much longer um, than polynomial time. They take something like exponential time or something like that. So uh, P versus NP as a question um, can be uh, reframed as a question that asks, if I have a non-deterministic machine and its equivalent deterministic machine, if I show that a non-deterministic machine um, can compute a particular problem um, or run a particular algorithm in polynomial time, um, does that infer that the, the equivalent deterministic machine um, can also solve or compute that problem um, in polynomial time? Um, and the general consensus is no, it cannot. Um, and that's based on the idea of massive parallelization like we were talking about before. Effectively, a non-deterministic machine is able to do many more computational steps per time step um, than, a poly than a deterministic machine, um, which sort of you would imagine that it has uh, the ability to solve a problem much more quickly, um, but actually trying to show that in a rigorous sort of mathematical sense has been uh, kind of elusive uh, to date. So uh, P versus NP as a general concept, um, the idea of polynomial versus poly non-polynomial time, and all of that stuff um, is going to be a situation that we get into at the very end of the class um, during the last week. Um, and we will definitely look deeper into this uh, situation, so don't necessarily beat yourself up um, or, or really try to dig too deeply um, about this quite yet. Um, the main focus of this, uh, this lecture is really about what, what happens when we add non-determinism to a Turing machine um, and what does that kind of buy us. And what we're answering that question with is um, potentially it is buying us the ability to solve problems much more quickly than with a deterministic machine. Um, that The proof of that has is, is been kind of elusive. Um, and so that wraps up um, what I wanted to talk about for non-deterministic machines. Um, in the next video, we're going to talk about what's called a universal Turing machine, um, which allows us to use a single Turing machine to run uh, multiple algorithms in order to do generalized or general uh, purpose processing, um, which is obviously a theoretical need um, because you don't necessarily have to run out and grab a new desktop computer for every different algorithm you want to write. Um, so until then, um, thank you for watching the videos, um, and I hope um, that they are being mildly helpful. Thanks, everyone.